Hello everyone, welcome to part four of the Logo Inlay Project, where I make this um, 10 inch by 16 inch aluminum inlay of my logo for ultimately brand recognition and those sweet, sweet YouTube views. In this video, I'm going to be actually finishing this and putting it together. These are gonna go in there. I'm gonna face it off, sand it, and do all that good stuff. Um, there's really only a few steps, really. These go in here and then it gets surfaced and then finished. Um, but there's a lot of little steps along the way. So let's start with actually getting these inside the pockets. And to do that, I'm actually going to use the bandsaw to trim out some of this excess because when these go in there and I start facing it down, these unsupported edges are gonna to wanna to kind of rip out. So I wanna make sure I don't have any of these um, kind of overhangs. So let's bring this over to the bandsaw and cut off the excess. As it turns out, I don't actually have a wood cutting bandsaw. I have a horizontal metal cutting bandsaw that can be used in the vertical position. So that's what I'm just gonna have to deal with for this. It cuts okay. Cutting curves and radiuses on a big, thick bandsaw blade like this is kind of tricky. So I was very conservative here just to make sure I didn't cut into the actual wood that I needed at all because that would have just been a really bad day. So I just cut off the majority of the bulk and that's all I needed to do. So here comes the fun part. We actually get to tap these in. I've been waiting to do this for, um, I guess, weeks now. So pretty excited about that. I am just going to use a um, rubber hammer and then a dead blow. And spoiler alert, I've actually done this whole thing before. If you look very closely, you can see that this is an inlay done out of MDF. So this is actually one, two, three, four total pieces here. And you can really only see the inlay at an angle and you can't feel or really see any transition. So as long as I keep these edges sharp, um, that's why I didn't do any kind of deburring on any of these edges. Um, everything hopefully should go in without any gaps whatsoever. So let's get to it. So there we go. It's actually kind of funny with the edges cut out. It's like a rough version. Um, you might be able to see this a little bit. There's just a hair underneath the wood and that is perfect. When I cut the wood, I did a um, adjustment of about 10 thou, I think, 10 or 20 thou. Um, so it cut a little bit deeper. So there should be just a little bit of a gap underneath, which is consistent in all the places. So yeah, it looks like everything is sitting nice and flush. And as you saw the amount of pounding that goes into getting these in here, I didn't use any glue or anything. I don't think these are just going to fall out. Um, they are in here very tight. And once I face this, everything should be fine. If it falls out, I can put it back in with some glue. So yeah, let's um, make sure everything is perfectly seated and then face this off for the big reveal. Since the aluminum is still attached to the MDF piece, it's really easy to clamp it back on the table. For setting the origin, I'm once again using the bottom left corner at the top. We'll get into the Z later. And I basically just eyeballed it. I just put some one, two, three blocks up against the X axis and the Y axis, and just kind of eyeballed the center of the end mill. For the actual facing operation, I have it extending a little bit past the workpiece anyway, so as long as I get this roughly correct, it's going to be just fine. 
Now for setting the Z height, I'm doing this all manually. The program is set to face at Z0, and all I need to do is set zero wherever I want to cut. This is gonna take multiple passes, so I'm just kind of eyeballing you know a little bit down i'll cut that go down a little bit more zero that out and just kind of keep going until i then reach the aluminum and then i can do a you know 10 thou finish pass after that I think out of all the cuts, I was most cautious or anxious about this facing pass because it's one of the last final cuts that I need to make. And if this gets screwed up, then everything gets screwed up. But it went okay. Um, as you can see here, when it goes back to do the next pass, it's kind of dragging through the workpiece a little bit. That means I'm taking more than a 0.2 inch depth of cut and my safe retract height is only 0.2 inches. So when it retracts up to move, it's not retracting up enough. And this turned out to be really a non-issue, but just something to keep in mind for the future. But overall, the Datron two flute end mill uh, ended up doing very nice on wood. It leaves a really good finish. Um, it cuts relatively fast, and I was overall pretty happy with the performance of this. It's mostly for aluminum, but since I'm going to be cutting the two of them together, I was really hoping it left a good finish on the wood as well. I ended up doing two passes in the wood only, and then the third pass is the one that got into the aluminum. The wood was sticking up, um, I'd say at least about three eighths of an inch, so doing two passes seemed pretty reasonable. And then the third pass, I cut both of them together, and I'll just kind of let you watch them without the audio of the mill actually running, because it's kind of cool to see the reveal um, as you start to get down into the inlay and reveal the two of them together. So. Here's what that looks like. Cutting the wood and the aluminum together turned out to be pretty okay. I didn't really have any issues with that. The only real issue I had was at the end of the cut, I realized that the dust shoe, the um, fringes on it are kind of too thick and they build up with the aluminum chips and the wood chips. And so it actually ended up clogging everything to where new chips couldn't get into it. And so at the end of the cut, when I lifted the head up and turned off the dust collector, just this huge mountain of chips came out of it. So I wasn't getting proper chip evacuation. That ended up not being an issue, but I'm definitely gonna look at a dust shoe that has less of the fringe or the fingers and maybe relies more just strictly on suction. So here's what it's looking like after all the facing. Now, um, something happened off camera that I didn't film. Over here on this side of the glasses, this side was actually a little bit loose and I pushed on it and it went in about mm, 20 thou of an inch, somewhere around there. So I don't think this side got fully seated. It was probably because that piece was slightly warped. So I pressed this in as much as I could and then did another pass so that this was all flat and smooth. However, in that process, this knot fully pulled out. Um, there was a knot over here and I, I knew about this. I chose this piece because it had this um, cool grain and this knot over here. Unfortunately, on one of those finishing passes, it just boop, sucked up into the dust shoe and pulled out completely. So I have this as an issue to deal with. Um, over here, there is a slight chip. It's very hard to see on camera. This can be filled in, no problem. That's not gonna be much of an issue. And then of course I have this crack right here. I knew this would happen and I was totally planning on that. There's a lot of really cool grain around here and I wanted that in the hair. So as I said in the um, previous video, I definitely did want a little bit of character to the wood. I could have very easily had this completely homogenous and boring, but that's not what I wanted. So let's talk about what we're going to do with this, this, and that.
So as I see it, this is a pretty straightforward fix, but this is really the issue that I have to think about. I have a few different options. I could machine something out, put in a plug and kind of have a patch, think of like a bow tie, something like that. I could completely replace this whole piece. At this point, that is still an option. So I could take this out, make a new one, put a new one in, face it off and profit. Or I could try filling this in in the same way that I'm filling in this. Now, I realize that on YouTube, um, using resin epoxy in wood is, well, a bit overdone to say the least. So I'm a little bit hesitant to do it, but I do feel like this at the very least is a perfect application for it. So I might as well try it down here. If it doesn't work out, I can always take out this piece, make a new one and start over. So that's really not a big deal. So what I'd like to do is try filling this and this in with an epoxy, surfacing it off, you know, not really taking any material off, just taking the epoxy off and seeing where that takes me. If I don't like the look of it, I can always just replace this piece or go a different route. So let's try that. I haven't really worked with epoxy before, so this is kind of my first time doing anything with it. My wife actually already had this epoxy, so I decided to just borrow some. The thing that we learned is some epoxies are mixed by weight and some are mixed by volume. This is definitely an epoxy that you mix by volume. We tried doing it by weight, but one of them weighs a little bit more than the other, so that kind of gets problematic. So I'm just trying my best to get a one-to-one -one ratio here because that's exactly what it calls for. It's a little bit difficult in such a small batch, but you know, just kind of eyeballing it really wasn't that big of a deal. My wife also had this um, really cool pigment pack and they're kind of like this metallic um, pigments. And I thought I would mix all of this together and then split the epoxy into two different cups, one of which would be this kind of mahogany copper color and the other would be this kind of dark uh, charcoal gray color. And I would kind of mix them together and swirl them to kind of, you know, simulate the grain of a knot. I started by pouring some of the epoxy into the crack in the hairline. I of course started with this up top because it was the, um, I guess, least visible of the two. And I wanted to make sure I kind of, you know, had everything figured out and I could abort before I got down to the beard. I'm using just kind of like this uh, bamboo popsicle stick type thing that's pointed just to kind of jam it inside that crack and get it inside. Now, I actually kind of forgot that I probably should have sealed the wood beforehand. Um, it didn't end up being an issue, but sealing the wood is generally kind of a good idea before pouring the epoxy. That's why I actually did the tape around it, just to keep it from going all over the top surface. And then I took this same epoxy and poured it down below in the beard area. I did actually add a little bit more of the gray on top and then use that little piece of wood just to kind of stir it around and create my own knot pattern in there. Um, I did kind of get maybe a little bit too much on here, so I'm kind of trying to remove a little bit of it. It turns out that this actually does either shrink or it soaks in one of the two and it ended up being um, not enough. I actually thought that I was having too much and I'd have to shave off a lot, but it ended up being just slightly below the surface once it cured. And you know, that really ended up not being that big of a deal, but just something to keep in mind with epoxy is it's probably a good idea to overfill it and then either sand or machine it down afterwards. Once everything was mixed the way I liked it and I knew everything was in the crevices, I just used a little mini handheld blowtorch to just pop all the bubbles that rise to the surface. So once the pour was done, I let this sit for five days. I think 72 hours or three days is the standard, but I poured this on a Sunday, so I didn't get back to it until the next following Friday. So five days is how long it took to cure. And then I just faced everything down to get the epoxy level with the face. I could have probably done this where I just took off the epoxy, but it actually sunk down just enough to where seven thousandth of an inch from the top is what I needed to make everything nice and level with that top surface. 
So here's what it looks like. I think I have all the CNC stuff done. It's all faced off. It's all nice and level. These are in place. Um, all the little gaps are filled up. I think we're ready to start finishing. So I could just start sanding this, but um, I did some previous tests before I started this project, and I found that if I sand the aluminum with the wood, I'm gonna get all this aluminum dust embedded inside the walnut, and it's really gonna hurt the finish. So I need to seal the wood. Um, I was talking with my dad about this project and he recommended this Waterlox sealer and finish. It's kind of a tongue oil based sealer that will actually seal the grain of the wood and hopefully fill up some of these pores. So I'm going to do three coats of that, let that dry over, um, you know, I think it's 24 hours per coat, let that all completely cure and then I can start doing the sanding without worrying about um, all of the dust getting inside the fine grain. Before I brush on the sealer, I wanted to show you how the knot turned out with the resin. Um, this is actually the resin, and um, I think the swirling and everything turned out really nice. It looks pretty much just like a wood knot. And if we wet it down a little bit, you can see that's how it's going to look. So I think it's a pretty convincing knot. So I was pretty happy with that. Applying the sealer is pretty straightforward. You just brush it on, let it soak in, wait 24 hours, brush it on, let it soak in, wait 24 hours, brush it, let it soak in, wait 24 hours. I'm doing a total of three coats here just so I make sure that nothing gets into the grain and that those pores are nice and sealed. So this is what it looks like after the first coat has soaked in. I think, um, yeah, this is about 24 hours from that first application, and I'm just applying a second coat. Um, it definitely did soak in really well. Um, apparently the first coat of sealer is the most important and soaks in the deepest. So you wanna make sure that it fully penetrates before you put on the second coat. I ended up also doing a third coat, as I said previously, but it really didn't look that different, so I don't really have any footage from that, but you know, pretty much the process looked exactly like this one did. And here's what it looks like right after I put on the third coat of sealer. This is, you know, maybe 15 minutes after I put it on. And you can see that it has a pretty heavy layer of the oil on top and it's not really soaking in anymore. So what this tells me is that it has fully soaked into the grain and adding any additional coats of this really won't offer any benefit. And here's what it looks like after letting that final third coat sit for about five days. Once again, same reason as before, I did it on a Sunday and now it is the weekend again so I can come back to this. So this is what it looks like. It has um, quite a bit of a shine to it and that's just because there's like a oil layer sitting on top so you can kind of hear what that sounds like versus uh, my workbench which is actually kind of sanded down just a little bit of that rough kind of oil layer. And um, here in the aluminum, which is not porous, um, you can kind of see there's like a yellowish film that you can kind of chip or sand off. So that's what we're gonna do is we're gonna sand all that off. The original plan was to have all of the finishing done in one single video, but here we are about, you know, 18, 19 minutes in, and I still have to do all of the sanding, all of the finishing, uh, mount the little French cleat mount on the back, and there's a few other things. So I'm gonna cut this video short, and in part two, we're actually gonna do all the sanding and the finishing and get this thing finalized. So as always, thanks for watching. Check me out on my Facebook page for any updates to my channel, and be sure to be on the lookout for part two, where we finish the logo inlay project.